Greetings, everyone. It is my great pleasure to be able to spend a few minutes today with a former student, the very wonderful and very colorful Adam Heffler. Heff, how the hell are you doing? Doing good. Hope you're doing well today. I'm doing better now that I'm talking with you. That always is a, a good thing for me to see our former students. Um, really proud of your work on the documentary. It's great to see you doing this level of work. Um, very emotional, very heavy, very important piece, in my opinion, that you've worked on. Can you tell us a bit about the documentary? Sure. So it's a documentary that covers how uh, the California prison system handled the COVID ep ep epidemic in the uh, early stages. And it specifically centers around a botched prison transfer in which uh, some very sick people were sent by a bus to San Quentin prison. And shortly after, surprise, surprise, everyone there got sick. And it is something that people that live in the Bay Area do remember, even though, you know, with, with all the things that were going on around that time, that it certainly hit the back page quicker than it should have. But um, it's important, I think, for people to see now a few years past that, you know, what really happened and get and get those insights. So um, I've worked on pieces in my life that had, you know, more meaning than just entertainment value. And I think there is something there. So like I said, you know, we're proud of the work that you did on this. I think it's an important piece that people need to see. Can you give us the name and some details about how people might see it? Um, it's called Sickness in the System. <laughs> And it is uh, currently available on fieldofvision.org. And um, yeah, it's freely viewable. That's incredible. Something like this should be, um, in my opinion, just mm -hmm. because of the nature of it. Um, can you tell us, you know, how your experience was? I, I know, I know that there was challenges as there are in any production. What was your experience working on this? Well, so it was a group of similarly experienced individuals like myself. So we were all hungry and really wanting to make the, the best out of a, of a very disturbing subject and, and make it shine so people can, can really get some visibility on the story. And um, yeah, it was very challenging. Uh, the process started in the middle of the, the lockdown. So it was really hard to coordinate and get everything together. But uh, we were able to pull together and, and make what I consider to be a film worth being proud of. What were what were the the job details that you had? How how did that go? What all did you do for the documentary? Um, I did pretty much all of the sound except for the music and uh, the conducting of the interview. So that means I was the sound designer. I was the foley artist. Um, the interviews are conducted over a very crude phone system that the prison holds. So I was involved with a little bit of the cleanup, making it so you can hear the words a little more crisply. Um, and yeah, basically, you know, in a small business kind of mentality, I had to wear a bunch of hats to help see it through. Fortunately, all I had to do was audio. Well, and, and that's still a challenge. And, you know, it, it is always challenging to work on any, you know, any film, any documentary, any commercial project, whether it's music, post-production, sound design, there's always going to be inherent challenges. That was actually something the director and I discussed. Uh, we did talk about potentially cleaning it up and making it sound as clean as possible. And we said, you know what, it's not really authentic to the act of calling someone on the on the phone in the prison. And uh, so we decided, you know, we want to clean it up so we can you can understand the words, but still, you want to make it sound like this person is actually talking to you from a prison payphone and telling you this story, and then you're watching it unfold before your very eyes. So um, yeah, that was an interesting challenge, um, especially because some of the there were a couple pieces of the interview actually handled after one of the inmates was released, and it was my job to actually match the bad sound quality with the uh, otherwise pristine talking over iPhones. You said that you did sound design fully, you wore a number of hats. Uh, what kind of fully did you do for this? Well, um, obviously one of the big staples of fully work is the footsteps. So there's a lot of footsteps and walking around various surfaces that I had to record. Um, there's also just shuffling in jail cells, shuffling inside a, a bus. Um, there's some handcuffs and other types of shackles that are involved. Um, probably a bunch of other things I don't immediately remember, but, um, yeah, there's also um, 
random yard sound effects I had to mix, kind of take some of the archival audio I was using and uh, help breathe some extra life into it. So what was your setup for recording fully? What's your microphone? How did you record it? Um, I used a shotgun mic, a Sennheiser, and I used my Zoom H5 and kind of mixed and matched as I as things worked and didn't work. And then, uh, you know, partially because I'm new and I don't have a brand new fangled studio and, you know, most of the stuff was being recorded during COVID. I had to do this in my living room and outside. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of improvisation and trial and error in terms of trying to find the right environments and effects. One of the things I'm not sure that, you know, the general public would understand is just how amazingly creative Foley artists and sound designers are. I've had the good fortune to have a number of colleagues and good friends in my life that that's been their profession, and they are just straight creativity. As a sound designer, what DAW do you use? I use Pro Tools to work to video and do some of the fine tuning. And then I use Ableton Live to do a lot of my more creative and freeform work. So um, in the case of this documentary, there are like large pieces of scenery where um, like I had to construct um, a kind of a wall of bed using various assets. So I would use Ableton to kind of draw that out and create a big chunk. And then I would use Pro Tools to, uh, to slice and dice it and have it actually conform to the needs of the scene. Awesome. Uh, for what it's worth, I've always thought that I love all the Dawes. It's like people talking about their kids. We love all of our <laughs> kids, but some more than others. Ableton and Pro Tools, peanut, peanut butter and jelly. I mean, they're just the most complimentary tools. They don't get in each other's way. Just, you know, I know that's completely subjective, but it's not at all a surprise for me to hear that you're using both for their strengths. Mm -hmm. Well, that's one thing that Pyramine taught me is the importance of knowing each dog's strength and weakness and kind of learning how to, to use as many dogs as possible and to use them to your own personal workflow. How did your education at Pyramine help you prepare for something that you didn't know was coming and, and hit you in the most challenging situation? How did the education help? I mean, broadly speaking, uh, it prepared me for everything because I walked into Pyramind really not knowing a thing about the craft other than what a few news articles and magazine clippings were telling me about it um, and the fact that I really wanted to do it. What tool that you used on the job was your favorite? In terms of software, hardware, anything goes? Yeah, anything. I'm probably going to have to say the, uh, the prison issue handcuffs that I was given from the props from the movie and the prison outfit. Cause they were really fun to kind of a, you know, work with some of the things that are kind of authentic to what's going on in the film. And uh, now I can say I own a pair of handcuffs and um, maybe this is a little eccentric to tell, but um, I would actually put on the prison uniform sometimes when working on the film to kind of get into the mood for it. And that was a very weird choice of mine. <laughs> I love it that you're trying to convince people that you didn't already own a pair of handcuffs and a prison uniform before the documentary, but I'm going to let that go. I'm just going to, she's not going to go down that road and pretend that that, you know, is all new to you. You have any thoughts for up and coming sound designers, people that are trying to get started? Any input, any suggestions, any thoughts for people? The first thing that comes to mind is that the rabbit hole is so much deeper than I ever could have expected. You know, I, I came into Pure Mind thinking I know nothing, and it turns out that that was even an understatement. Thank you. Appreciate the time, Adam. Uh, look forward to talking to you again. Thank you. It's a pleasure.